Hi guys, I wanted to uh, conclude lesson 4.1 part 2 with this video for you guys. Last class we had some examples of stratification, stratified random samples, cluster samples. We did talk about some uh, real world consequences and applications, things like that. Uh, and we also did a chip sampling activity, which I hope was insightful as to why we can trust random sampling. But we never actually went through and did an example of a cluster sample or a stratified random sample. So um, I'm going to read the example with you. We'll do example two. Uh, you, you can read through this by yourself. I'm not going to read through everything word by word on the note sheet since you're doing this at home. And then example three, you can do that too. That's a, a second version of example two. It's the same thing, just repeated. Uh, and then we'll jump into some of the inference for sampling. Okay. And so uh, let's read this. It says sampling at a school assembly. Okay. How should I sample? Student council wants to conduct a survey during the first five minutes of an all school assembly in the auditorium about the use of the library. They would like to announce the results of the survey at the end of the assembly. Uh, student council president asks your statistics class to help out carry the survey. Okay, there are 800 students present at the assembly. Map of the auditorium is shown. Note that students are seated by grade level and that the seats are numbered 1 to 800. All right. So what does that mean? Uh, 1 to 200 or 12th grade seats. So 1 would be here and 200 would be here somewhere. Okay, 200 would be here somewhere and then 201 would be here and 400 would be here somewhere. Okay, and so on. All right. Um, so what you can see is in a row, I have a grade level, and then columns would contain different grade levels of students. I think I'm saying that right. Okay, so let's uh, let's think about this um, and answer the question. Describe how you would use each of the following sample methods to select 80 students to complete the survey. So a simple random sample is that problem of Yes, it's easy to do, but how do I get to, you know, kid 26 or kid 766 or someone in between here somewhere um, in the middle of an assembly that might not be too easy or I'm running around a lot, something like that. So uh, taking the sample is easy though, simple, simple random sample, uh, you would just say um, to your calculator, do something like rand int no rep something like this and just do from 1 to 800 give me 80 and it will just spit out uh, 80 students all right um, of course the presupposition here is that you have numbered uh, well actually in this case the seats are numbered, so you don't have to number the students by name or anything like that, okay? So that's a little bit easier than what we've described earlier in our um, random sampling of people or places or things. And so you just do that. You get 80 numbers, go to the students in those chairs, give them the survey, and you're done, okay? So uh, you can say something like just randomly select 80 students uh, and then uh, give the survey to those students okay uh, and actually we should probably say actually give the survey uh, randomly select 80 seats all right, then give the survey to those students occupying the seats, something like that. Uh, something like that. That's maybe a bit clearer. So the, the goal of this type of thing is that you can explain your random selection process so that someone else could follow it. 
right? Someone else could follow it. So this would technically give me 80 randomly selected seats or seat numbers. Okay, so a simple random sample is easy to take, not so easy to go and give all the students the survey in there, all right? Uh, then, how would you do a stratified random sample? So remember, strata, strata have to be similar within each stratum and different between strata, okay? Uh, and so, how can I group students that they are the same in their group and different between groups? We already discussed this. We said um, we can use uh, grade levels as strata, okay? Um, and then this is only really useful if uh, we suspect uh, there's a reason for putting students in groups of grade levels. So if we suspect uh, library use is similar within grade levels, okay, uh, within grade levels. So Again, this is about library use. You want to ask use of the library, okay? And again, a stratified random sample should be similar within the strata. So here the students would be similar within the strata because they're the same grade level. And also if I think that somehow the same grade level has some similar attribute when it comes to library use, all right? Uh, and so that's how you pick the strata you intelligently select the strata, and um, then you just go and sample. Now, we want to keep the sampling representative of each grade level, so you would do something like, uh, if my sample size is 80, I would select uh, 20 students randomly from each grade level okay so I'd select 20 students randomly for each grade level and how would I do that so you would take an SRS within each strata okay uh, by taking an SRS within each stratum okay all right SRS of size 20 in each stratum. Okay, that's exactly how a uh, stratified random sample works. And how would I actually complete this on my calculator? So you could say a ninth grade. So where, where would the ninth grade be? Ninth grade are from 601 to 800. So I could do something like this. Uh, rand int no rep and then say for ninth grade 600 numbers between 601 to 800 and I want 20 of those students that would give me 29th graders okay and then I do the same thing randing no rep but now I go with another grade level so 401 to 600, uh, 401 to 600, and give me 20, and that would give me 20 tenth graders, and so on and so forth, okay? I think you get the idea. That would lead me to a stratified random sample, and in the end, I would combine all four groups of 20 into a sample of 80 students, okay? And then cluster sample, uh, so clusters are supposed to be similar between clusters, but different within the clusters. So in the cluster, I need to have uh, diversity of individuals. So uh, we said that if this is a grade level and then seniors, okay, in this case, and then starting at seat number 201, I have 11th graders. So in here, 201 would be 11th graders. So this is 12th grade. From here I would have 11th graders. And then starting at seat 
401, I'd have 10th graders, so seat 401. I'd have 10th graders, and then starting seat 601. Uh, so starting at six seat 601, I'd have a ninth graders. So basically what I'm saying is uh, if I do this and call this a cluster, okay, then within one cluster, I will have each grade level represented. And I will also have the same number of students represented. Um, that works out very, very conveniently and nicely that way. Okay, so I would have the same number of each grade level in each cluster and each cluster would contain the same number of students. So everything just works out hunky-dory. It doesn't really work that way in real life all the time, but okay. Uh, you try and do your best in real life. So cluster sample, that sounds fine. Okay, so say uh, use columns as clusters, all right? Uh, and then, um, there are 20 clusters, okay? So 20 clusters, and they're conveniently numbered right here. Uh, cluster one, cluster two, da, 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 all the way to cluster 20, okay? <laughs> so what I would do is, remember, a cluster sample is different from a stratified random sample. Cluster sample, you randomly select clusters and then include a whole cluster in your group, uh, in your sample. But how many students in a cluster uh, there are from let's say 1 to uh, 781, it's 1, 21, 31, 41, all the way to 781. And if you tally that up carefully, you'll see that this actually, one cluster includes 40 seats, okay? 40 seats in a cluster. So what we want to do is actually only select two clusters randomly from the 20 and then survey everybody in the cluster, okay? Um, so, uh, what we want to do is use columns as clusters. Uh, there are 20 columns slash clusters, okay? Uh, so, we select two clusters randomly, and you would do that by doing something like rand int no rep and you would do uh, how would that work one to 20 clusters and just give me two all right you get two numbers for clusters go to that cluster and then in there just give everybody the survey okay and that would yield uh, that would yield two Oh, that's not the word cluster. Two clusters of 40 students, <clears throat> uh, which would be 80 students for my sample. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one problem. So uh, let's say two clusters of students. Okay. Yeah. And then we say give every student. in the cluster of the survey. This is taking forever. Okay, only one problem here. Um, with the cluster example is um, if there's any kind of similarity between students in the cluster, then you have potentially not taken the best sample. So the textbook says, I think the textbook says something like this. A problem that can occur is I could randomly just select this cluster or maybe this cluster or maybe this one or maybe this one. And then, you know, that could be randomly my one cluster of 40 students. But it could also be that most of those students came late to the assembly and they may be somehow similar in their library use. Maybe they don't use the library, maybe they use the library more, maybe they're late because they were in the library, who knows, okay? So uh, there's some issues here that if I, if I randomly select that cluster 
or this one or this one or this one uh, which is very possible uh, then I could potentially have a cluster of students that are the same somehow systematically because of some behavior they have in common and so remember we said cluster should be different within should not be completely the same we want individuals to be varied and different so that's the only possible issue there so I think uh, this is the best type of sampling arrangement for the stratified random sampling is the best type of sampling arrangement for this specific example okay I guess you could try and make the same argument going by rows or something like that but uh, I think that that stratified random sample is still better. Okay, all right, all right. So let's let me move on from this. That took forever for one example. Um, hopefully, you understand that. We spend a lot of time on this in class too, so you can read that. Have fun. Inference for sampling. Okay, I'll try and read through this with you fairly quickly, so um, we could just highlight some important parts. Uh, yeah, so, mm, let's see. Uh, okay, so this is great. This is a great uh, phrase here. The first reason to rely on random sampling is to eliminate bias. Okay, so, of course, that's why we do random sampling. I don't want to choose all my friends for a sample, convenient sample, something like that, voluntary response, something like that. So, uh, we want to remove bias so we eliminate bias that's why we do random sampling okay um, and hopefully after this activity uh, you can see that um, we can trust random samples okay why can we trust them the chip activity is supposed to show you that um, the random sampling doesn't just haphazardly give you some kind of a result there's some kind of structure to it chance has some has laws that govern it called probability okay and so um, we can trust random sampling because it usually gives us a fairly good estimate of the truth about the population once we measure the individuals in the population and um, it also definitely removes our bias okay uh, but there's still probably let me use the highlighter rather there's probably still some issues that come up. Uh, we can't be sure that we're exactly right, all right? Uh, and that's obvious. We, we, there's going to be some um, variability between or some difference between the truth of a population, of the whole population, if I had everybody and I recorded something about them uh, compared to what my sample will reveal. So that difference between the truth and what the sample says is what we call margin of error. Oh, it's what we call margin of error. Okay. Now, please don't get hung up on this right now. A lot of students want to know. Okay, what's margin of error? Tell me exactly the formula. Who? Uh, we do that way, 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 way later. Okay. We do that in like chapter eight, nine, ten. We talk about margin of error, and it differs for different types of samples and different kinds of things you're measuring and stuff like that. So. Uh, please, we will talk about that a lot later. Don't get hung up on margin of error. Okay, in Algebra 2, we actually spoke about this for sampling surveys, but it's very different from each, for each different type of situation. So we'll talk about margin of error, um, but it just says, you know, as samples vary, you'll get different types of information. So you guys saw on the board when you did your chip activity, some students got a very different number from other students. There'll be variability. But on the whole, we know we can trust the result when we look at the average of all the samples. Okay, And so usually, uh, random sampling gives us fairly good information. And we can kind of predict how big our mistake might be using the margin of error. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, also, definitely something that we always have to talk about is this huge, huge, huge. The bigger the sample, the better information about the population. Okay, that's always true. Uh, for our class, there's some rules for how big our sample can be, which we'll get to later. But definitely, a bigger sample is better. All right. Um, if we did this, we would have had much better information about the sample 
um, except that would technically violate one of our rules for calculating statistics. But if we weren't even calculating statistics and just looking at some uh, proportion of chips, this would definitely give us better information if you had taken a sample size 40. All right. Uh, and I'll let you read that. That's okay. So let's talk about some issues in random sampling or sample surveys. What can go wrong? Things people do wrong. And I just want to say this to you. Uh, so this is what I was trying to say earlier. Um, even very large sample will give a result that differs from the truth about population. Okay. And so this is called sampling variability. All right. And again, the margin of error uh, uh, will help us account for that type of variability. So we will look at something like a confidence interval or something like that when we're estimating uh, something about a population. All right. And so we'll talk about that more too uh, later. Um, and so before we start talking about sampling errors and what can go wrong and stuff like that, um, you should add this to your note sheet, okay? Uh, when describing, when describing, uh, what can go wrong? What can go wrong in a sample survey? Okay, uh, clearly describe the error uh, in context please in context okay uh, and then uh, t -t 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 yeah clearly describe the error in context okay okay that's that was the point of that all right add that to your note sheet that's very important so use context so you know we're talking about chips then talk about chips you know you're talking about something else sampling people talk about what kind of people you know would have been not sampled or something like that uh, in context uh, don't just uh, name the error okay you get almost no credit for doing that. Naming the error is, is supposed to be not too bad. Explaining exactly in context what the problem is, that's the harder part, the deeper, more conceptual part. All right, so let's talk about the sampling errors. Let me switch to a different color here. So sampling errors, think about sampling errors like this, okay? We can think of this as mistakes. Um, the sampler makes the sam makes so when I take a sample sampling error is something I do wrong okay I do wrong and so um, one of the things that I do wrong when I sample is using bad sampling techniques okay such as voluntary response etc uh, other ones are things that are much harder to deal with um, but sampling usually begins with a sampling frame, a list of people, okay? So actually this year when you do your study, you will most likely be doing, uh, studying our student body or something like that. And so you will have a list of names of students and that list would be considered your sampling frame, okay? Um, but in reality, in practice, when we're talking about like popu big populations like the US or Seoul or you know, something like that, a whole country, uh, there'll be some degree of under coverage, okay? And so what that means is this. It means um, some groups in the population are left out of the process of choosing the sample. So we, we don't really use, have under coverage in our school if your target population is the high school. We have all the names of the students in the high school. There's no real issue with that. But... Um, it's easy to leave people out of your uh, sampling frame when you're talking about an entire population like the US, okay? And so there are e examples here of, you know, households will miss homeless people, prison inmates, and student dormitories. So you get some list of households, then you're missing people in the population uh, that you might want to know their opinion about something. So. 
that would be called under coverage if I exclude a group of the uh, portion of the population and don't ask them my survey question okay then I don't really know what everybody thinks I only know what some people think so that's not usually a good thing uh, and then sample errors in careful sample survey sampling errors in careful sample surveys are usually quite small all right so you can do everything you can and still have some kind of uh, sampling error it's hard to avoid every single mistake all right uh, all right so sampling errors are the, the big one is under coverage i first of all use a bad technique that's one sampling error or I have other issues like having a sample frame that doesn't include everybody. A sampling frame doesn't include everybody. All right, then other things are non-sampling errors, and this is worse because you can't control this. So, uh, so a non-sampling error is not a mistake I make, okay? This is not the sampler's mistake. Necessarily, all right? So uh, the biggest one, if you've ever sent a survey as a student to other students, you know this, is non-response, all right? You send a survey to people and they don't respond, okay, non-response. And it says uh, here, non-response to sample surveys often exceed 50%. And then at the bottom here, I'm not going to read this whole massive thing with you, but it says, um, you know, for the... Census Bureau's American Community Survey, uh, they had non-response as high as 73%. Okay, that's <coughs> pretty bad. Uh, sorry, sorry, non-response rate of 73%. Yes, that's pretty bad. Okay, and so, um, yeah, non-response is a huge issue, but it's not your fault. People don't respond to your survey. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, you can try and do things before the fact to try and before you give the survey to try and make the response rate higher but ultimately once you've selected a sample and you try and contact them to take the survey and they don't respond they don't respond there's nothing you can do it's non-response okay so remember, just remember one thing non-response when happens when you've already chosen people for a sample okay and then they don't want to or they can't be found they don't want to participate or they don't can't be found um, so that's not voluntary response. You've already chosen the sample, the person is in your sample and they say, I don't want to respond or you can't reach them to have them respond. Non -res voluntary response is very different, okay? Voluntary response, everybody who responded is in the sample, all right? Everybody who responded is in the sample. So uh, this is a good thing here. Non-response can only happen after I have selected you to be in my sample. Voluntary response, everybody is already part of the sample because they responded. So there's no non-response in the voluntary response uh, uh, sample, all right? Uh, and a voluntary response sample would be an idea of sampling error, not non-sampling error, okay? So in any case, uh, you can process that. Please think about it carefully. Uh, other types of things that are not necessarily my mistake but um, could still be happening are something like response bias. All right, so, uh, you know, I gave you an example of, let's say the principal interviews you and asks you a question. You may not give them the truth because you want to say something that makes them happy because you're afraid of them or because they have some control over you. Okay. Or when I ask you a question in class, you may respond a specific way because you want you think if I don't like you, I might lower your grade or something like that. So people in authority over you or power over you, um, you may answer differently. Not always. Some people are completely honest. But so response bias can happen when you ask someone a question and they lie to you. Okay. Now uh, just think about this carefully. So uh, if you read this carefully, it talks about you could lie intentionally, you could lie unintentionally, there's many different ways, but if the response to a question is a lie, intentionally or otherwise, then there's response bias, all right? Uh, and so if you read that carefully, you'll see scenarios of, <laughs> in which there are response bias. Uh, and then wording of questions, 
This is very, very, very hard to do a survey properly to write good questions for a survey um, and how to rate and all those rating scales and is it you know, from one to five and all those kind of things. Writing a survey with proper questions is really, really difficult. Um, so your questions could be confusing. People can misinterpret what you mean. Even if you're trying to say one thing or ask one thing, they think you're asking a different thing. You could be leading people uh, and, you know, just changing the words can change the outcome of a survey heavily. I mean, all these things are, um, you know, very difficult to fix. Uh, but so, so wording of questions is not a sampling error. It's, a, it's an error with my survey. I could have picked my sample in a great way, but then... Uh, the way my survey is worded gives me biased information, even though that's got nothing to do with my sampling technique. Okay, so uh, response bias, nothing to do with my sampling technique. I have great questions. I have a great sampling technique. I reach people and they lie to me. What can I do about that? All right, that's not something I can really take control of. So, <clears throat> um, not the sampler's mistake. Okay, you can do things to try and mitigate those things, but it's not something I did wrong necessarily. <laughs> Uh, so, wording of questions, I mean, you can read this. Changing the wording frequently changes the outcome. Um, whether it's terrible wording or not, if you just change it, you probably get a different outcome. Uh, and then don't trust the results. So, so, this is a big thing. When you see the news and they talk about the results to a poll question, they show you the question usually. You're hoping that you can trust them when they're showing you the entire question, but you know, <coughs> you really need to be looking at um, a question before you look at the data and go, oh, this is the answer to the question. This is the data about the answer to the question, okay? Uh, and then you can read this. Uh, this goes over better in person if I explain it to you, but you know, read the question. If you switch the order of the words, of the, of the words, of the questions, what happens? So if you switch them around, it really has some kind of a different influence on you, right? Um, that's like saying, what are your grades like? You say, oh, my grades are great. And then they say, hey, how do you like school? Oh, I like school great. Or, uh, you know, how do you like school? Oh, school is great. Well, how are your grades? Oh, my grades are great. Okay, those might not be different. But if you say, how's school? Oh, I like school. And someone says to you, well, what are your grades like? Oh, I've got Fs. Oh, yeah, maybe I don't really like school that much. Okay, so if you asked, what's your grades like? And your response was, oh, I've got a bunch of Fs. And then I ask how you like school. Maybe you'll say school is terrible. So the, switching the order definitely changes things. Uh, or has the potential to change people's answers to questions. Um, then example six, I'm just going to go through this quickly because this video is already 49,000 hours long. Um, uh, so it's, this says for each of the following, it, there is a source of error, label error, a sampling and non-sampling and explain your answer. So telephone directory as a sampling frame as my list of people and you say likely to be under coverage which is a sampling error okay um, and you say someone who's not in the directory can't be reached all right uh, people not listed can't be reached or won't be included in my sample okay can't be reached to be in the sample okay something like that uh, and then a uh, person cannot be contacted in five calls this would be so for me to be calling the person I should first have selected them to be in my sample so They've already been selected to be in my sample. Now I call them and they don't respond. So that is called non-response. And that would be an example of a non-sampling 
error. We're presuming my technique to find them and include them in my sample was good, but they don't respond. So that's a non-sampling error. It's not my fault they're not responding. Okay, and then um, what else? This would definitely be a sampling error. Okay, uh, that's but that's a different type of sampling error. This is just poor sampling. This is like a convenience sample. Okay, like a convenience sample uh, and you say you know so like a convenience sample what's the problem here uh, you know I might just be picking a whole bunch of people that have the same opinion at the same time right uh, they might be together because they're friends or in a big group or something like that so many things can go wrong with this idea so this is just a convenience sample. This is definitely a sampling error, though, not one of the ones we've discussed in this lesson so far, I think. Uh, and then uh, you have this idea. Survey paid for by makers of disposable diapers found that 84% of the sample opposed banning disposable diapers. Here's the actual question. It's estimated disposable diapers account for less than 2% of the trash in today's landfills. In contrast... Uh, beverage containers, third class mail and yard wastes are estimated to account for about 25% of trash and landfills. Given this, in your opinion, would it be fair to, dispo to ban disposable diapers? All right, what's the problem? Uh, it surely seems like uh, this information right here makes disposable diapers seem not too harmful. Okay, so uh, the wording seems to minimize the impact of disposable diapers on the environment. Okay, environment. All right, uh, what type of thing would this lead to? So that's the problem. Uh, and what type of, what would this lead to? Probably an overestimate. Probably this would lead to an overestimate. Let me write a full sentence. Uh, this would lead to an overestimate. Over S. Mm -hmm estimate of what uh, overestimate of the of people opposed to banning uh, disposable diapers okay or you could say an underestimate of people in favor of banning, okay? An underestimate of people in favor of banning disposable diapers. Either one is fine, but just remember, you must always say uh, the direction of the bias, so over or underestimate, and specify who will be over or underestimated, and then also explain where the bias comes from. This is not that easy, okay? This is not that easy. So. Uh, you guys will have a quiz on this, and it's not that easy. So think through this stuff very, very carefully, please. It's quite challenging, actually, to find errors uh, in sampling techniques or non-sampling errors or sampling errors, all that kind of stuff. Thanks, guys.